I'm so excited today. I am here with Steve Schwartz. Uh, he has the LSAT blog, which I'm really excited because I actually read this while I was getting ready for law school. And he also has LSAT Unplugged. This is a podcast. It's available on Spotify, iTunes, and I'm pretty sure it's available on other podcast um, apps as well. And also he has a YouTube channel. So I'm really excited to be here with you today talking about this. Thanks for having me, Mia. Pleasure to be chatting with you. Awesome. So just let's jump right in. So exactly what does the LSAT test? What are they looking for uh, with all these interesting questions that they have? So ultimately, the LSAT is looking to test two big things. It's looking to test your short-term working memory and to test your critical reasoning skills. So your ability to be skeptical, to evaluate and analyze arguments properly. And those are things that I'm sure you can speak to later. Those relate to law school quite a bit when you're evaluating cases, real world situations. And so they test this based on a few different question types. There are logic games, which are short puzzles that are kind of mathematical in nature that re re kind of uh, relate to fact patterns in law school cases, I imagine. Then there's logical reasoning, which are short bite-sized arguments. And then there's reading comprehension, which are short passages that at first glance look similar to what you see on the SAT but are actually looking for something a little bit different, once again, analyzing arguments. And so that's what ultimately the LSAT's testing. And the reason they do this is because it really closely mirrors what your first year law school will be like. And so there's a correlation between the L performance on the LSAT and your first year law school grades on average, although of course it can vary quite a bit depending on how much time you invest in each. So what uh, testing um, the programs that we would have, like Kaplan and Themis, like which did you find were the most helpful? Well, so Kaplan, Kaplan, I can't speak too much positively, too positively about it because there are certain conceptual differences I have related to the exam. And then Themis, I'm not, I didn't even know they do LSAT prep. I thought they did more specifically the bar, but I, I could be wrong about that. What I found honestly most helpful was just doing actual official LSAT prep tests and reviewing them in depth. I would go into the book. I started off by going into the bookstore and just kind of gathering all the books that looked decent. But I actually discovered later that a lot of them weren't using real LSAT questions. And so they would be unrealistic and not really properly reflect the exam. Or in even some cases, they contain mistakes, like errors in the problems themselves or errors in the answer key. And I found that really discouraging, of course. And so I recommend students stay away from those. The actual official LSAT prep tests published by LSAC are the best prep material, and they're available in books of 10 on Amazon for about $20 each. And so that's probably the best starting point I'd recommend and what I found the most helpful. Mm -hmm. um, so what kind of mindset take, does taking this test require? Like up from, okay, I want to go to law school. What do I need to do? You know, prepping for like finding your material, studying, and then the actual day of the test. What kind of mindset would you say that everyone looking into law school needs to focus on. So I think that we have this strange phenomenon when it comes to studying for the LSAT, which is that people who tend to score lower are actually often overconfident in their ability to evaluate an argument. And they don't always actually, they, they infer too much or assume too much. As you improve your understanding of the LSAT, what you come to learn over time is that you actually cannot always infer or assume as much as you might think you can. For example, in logical reasoning, the evidence does not necessarily guarantee the conclusion. So you want to have this, again, critical skeptical mindset where you say to yourself, okay, well, the evidence is true, but how might it be possible that the conclusion is not true? And of course, LSAC is laying various traps on the exam. And so you want to make sure you're not falling into those traps by assuming too much. They often play on common misconceptions or common themes where we might associate certain concepts that are not necessarily associated in reality. So to give a concrete example of this, there's one great LSAT question I love where there's a doctor who is actually supporting a ban on smoking in public places, even though the doctor himself smokes. And so there's a couple of things going on there. Why would a doctor smoke? Doctors are supposed to be healthy, right? And then mm -hmm. why would someone who smokes want to ban smoking if they like to smoke? Mm -hmm. So that's obviously a very unique situation that we wouldn't expect or assume in the real world, but it's also entirely possible that somebody would feel that way. I mean, I, I live near a hospital. There's nurses and doctors smoking outside of it all the time, and they might still right. think, well, smoking's bad. We don't want it, but 
of course, practice and you know, practice and application are two different things, right? I would definitely agree that even continuing on into law school, that is something that they still focus on is paying attention to facts as opposed to like letting your, I guess, logic or something not making sense, like kind of pull your mind away from what's important. <laughs> so how would you recommend studying for the LSAT? Like so recommend frequency? Yeah, sure. So first of all, you want to choose a target test date that gives you adequate time to study. Most people study over a period of two to three months because that's what all they want to devote to it. And that's how the traditional in-person classes are structured. But that's not typically enough for students to reach their fullest potential. I typically recommend actually studying over a period of five to six months, which is a lot. But given the LSAT's importance, that's not really that much time at all. If you think about it, you get your undergraduate GPA over the course of three to four years or more. And the LSAT's more important than that but it all comes down to that one test day or multiple if you retake it. And so for that reason, five to six months devoted where you're devoting maybe 10 to 15 hours a week, that could be enough. But if it takes you longer, if family obligations get in the way or you have long hours at work, then it might be a good idea to lengthen your study timeline a bit, maybe po postpone your test date to a later one if you need to. And then there's also retaking. If you, let's say you were scoring in the one, let's say you were scoring around a 155, on test day, you drop to a 152, it could be worth retaking because there's a score band of about three and a half points on either end, meaning that if your true aptitude is a 155, you might get a 152 one day and a 158 another day, just by, just by luck. And so if you retake it and you get a 158 next time, you got six points higher, even if you change nothing at all. And so given that law schools do not average multiple LSAT scores, there's kind of always a reason to retake now. And you don't want to go nuts on it and take it seven or eight times. At a certain point, you want to say enough is enough. But right. if you start early, let's say we're, we're talking right now in March, April, let's say you could take it in June or July or both. You could then take it again in September and still apply early in the cycle this fall. Okay. So I remember when I was taking the LSAT, they said that they do average the scores. So that's not a thing. They, t they take your highest score that you get. Yeah, so there's a lot of confusion around this, and it's, it's, it's frustrating for everybody. Back in 2006, the American Bar Association changed its policy. It used to be that it required law schools to submit the average, score, the average of multiple scores for their matriculating students. That changed in 2006, though. Now, going forward, they only consider the highest. That's all they have to submit to the American Bar Association, and that's all that gets calculated in the U.S. news rankings, which are what everybody cares about, right? So it's important to realize that there might be some outdated information on law school websites or law schools want to give the appearance of being holistic. They may be think that it sounds nicer. A lot of times they'll use this vague kind of weaselly language that they consider multiple scores. But what does it really mean to consider multiple scores? How does that factor into the calculations they make where they take your LSAT score, your GPA, they have what's called an admissions index where they kind of run them through a formula to dictate whether they accept you or not. And of course, there are many other factors too, like personal statement, letters of rec, et cetera, but the numbers are typically the biggest factor there. Right. Um, yeah, because they had told us like not to, to be overly confident while going into our first LSAT because it essentially, if you didn't perform as well on the first one, then if you continue to take it, that it looks poorly on you. So you're saying that that's not true at all. That's not really true. I mean, of course, I wouldn't recommend taking it cold for real on test day and then say, okay, well, just to see how I'll do. And then of course, maybe you get a low score, which is natural because you haven't studied it yet. So a mm -hmm. low score followed by a much higher score is not as good as just having the higher score alone, for sure. Right. It's never great to have a low score on your record if you can avoid it. But even if you did, it wouldn't really be that big a deal because, mm -hmm. again, what's their, what are their incentives? Law school admission officers are largely driven by increasing their school's ranking, and they do that by admitting, admitting students with the highest possible GPAs and LSAT scores. And so I think you really do have to look at their incentives here. When you're talking about studying, uh, you know, enough like throughout the week would you suggest maybe studying once a day if you could like even if it's for like 30 minutes an hour or do you think that you should you know kind of save the studying for when you can actually do in depth like and spend you know two three hours at a time that's a great question I've, I've spent a lot of time thinking about how to structure studying one of the first things that people started asking me when i started the lsat blog over 10 years ago now was how should I prep for the next LSAT? What should I do each week? And then what should I do each day? And so I created week-by-week -week plans, day-by-day plans as well, where I really break it down what to do 
every single day. So which articles to read on my website, which books to read it, which pages to read in an LSAT textbook, and then of course, which problems to complete out of the actual LSAT exams. And so when you're looking at it week by week or day by day, I'll typically recommend maybe on a weekday, two to three hours, maybe on a weekend, five to six hours. I would never do more than five or six hours in a day because that can lead to burnout. And at a certain point, your brain's fried, it becomes diminishing marginal returns. And so it would depend on the student. Let's say you're a college student where you have classes Monday to Thursday, then maybe you do more of your studying Friday to Sunday. Or if you're working Monday to Friday, then maybe before work, during lunch, after work, you squeeze it in where you can, then of course, weekends as well. So I'd say you want to you want to carve out the time, but even if you're working, let's say as a paralegal from nine to five, nine to six, you ask your boss, "Can I get out at six every single day so I can still study?" Then you maybe get to work an hour early. You use a half hour at lunch, an hour or two in the evening before you go home. Mm-hmm. Would you you said that five to six months would be ideal? What would you say to someone preparing longer? Do you think that that could lead to a burnout, or do you think more time if you had that much more time to prepare? Do you think that that would help? That's a great question. And I I do encounter students like that. I'll typically they're students who are in the very fortunate position to have their parents supporting them, or they just maybe they end up studying for longer than six months, not with the plan to, but because they keep postponing. And so either way, it can lead to burnout. It typically leads to burnout when a student is studying full time, they have nothing else going on. They're not working. They're not in school. They just have the opportunity then to become obsessed with the exam. And so those are the people where I'd say five to six hours every single day for a period of six months, seven months, eight months, that's that's way too much. You're going to burn out, no question. And so I would say, if that's your situation, maybe keep it to four to five hours some days. But you could do, if you're studying for six months or longer, you could study only three to four days a week and that would be enough. And then you can also make sure everything else in your life is going smoothly. So you're eating well, you're exercising, you're getting enough sleep, you're getting outdoors, you're socializing. All that stuff really does make a difference because you've got to be at your sharpest for the LSAT. If you're even a little bit off, if you're tired, if you're hungover, if you're a little bit rusty, all that can have an impact even though your understanding of the exam has not changed. You just You want to be sharp. Then for the student who, let's say, is working long hours and postponing, and for that reason, they end up studying for six months or longer, they're not at at as much risk of burnout. But what I would tell them is really be conscious of carving out the time so that this doesn't kind of stay on the back burner forever. Mm -hmm. So since I found that um, people are going to law school at older ages, like they're not going right after undergrad. uh, So what would you suggest for someone with a family, children? How would you go about factoring and studying time with all those other obligations going on? Yeah, that's a great question. I I definitely see more and more non-traditional applicants who are coming out to law school after a few years from undergrad, maybe being working for a while. And that definitely places additional um, obstacles or barriers that you have to overcome. Because of course, if you have kids, you have a family, those are obligations that take time. And they're important, but they do take time. And so I think really getting support from your significant other, from your spouse, from your family members to help you out during that time where Maybe they take the kids for a while, so you at least have a se- several hour chunk on a weekend to, to get some studying done. That can really be a huge help. But then I would also recommend lengthening your study timeline because if you've been out of school for a while, it can be harder to get back into study mode. And there's no easy answer on that. You really just need to lengthen your study timeline, maybe set a longer goal. And so maybe you don't apply this fall, but you apply the following fall and you very gradually increase your understanding of the exam over time. Mm-hmm. Would you recommend studying up until the day of the LSAT? I recommend studying till the day before. So let's say most LSAT test dates are on Saturdays. And so if that's the case for you, then take off Friday. On Friday, don't do anything. So relax, take a hot bath, binge watch Netflix, go for a walk in the park. It's all good. But I would not be doing a, another full-length timed exam the day before because you don't want to burn out. You want to go in fresh. But you do want to also do several timed exams in the lead up to your test date. And so even if, let's say, if you're in the final month or two, I would say at that point, you want to mainly be doing a timed exam every single week, along with detailed review of that exam. But maybe if your test date is Saturday, say it's um, Saturday, March 30th, then you could take the exam, a timed exam on Saturday, March 23rd, and then just do a bit of review, a bit of brushing up, a bit of review of weak areas over the course of that week leading up to it. But I wouldn't overdo it in the final week or the day before, especially. 
what are the most common mistakes that people make when it's like, whether it be prepping for the LSAT or the day of while they're taking it? Day of taking it, I'd say not knowing where your test center is and not allowing enough time to find the room. A lot of times uh, LSATs are offered on college campuses or law school campuses. And if you've never been there before, it can be kind of a big maze to find the right place. So wake up early, get there early. Don't bring your cell phone. The LSAT test makers do not allow you to bring your test fo- cell phone to the test center. And obviously we're all attached to our phones these days. And you're like, well, how am I going to get home? Am I going to find an Uber? You know, it's tough. But you find a pay phone, borrow one from somebody. They have kicked people out for bringing their cell phones. And so definitely don't do that. Also try to avoid talking to other people at the test center because they can stress you out depending on, you never know what they're going to say. And so I kind of find my own corner to hide from them all and just kind of be on my own. And then other common mistakes, I'd say we covered a few of them already. One of them is not allowing enough time. And so two to three months, is typically not enough to achieve your fullest potential, allow longer. The other thing is using proper study materials, not using any old book you find in the bookstore. You know, Barron's, Kaplan, a lot of them are not using real LSAT questions. And then on Amazon, definitely be on the lookout for books with fake reviews. You want to make sure they're saying they use real LSAT problems. If they do, they'll say it on the cover. They'll say that because they want to brag about it because they're paying licensing fees to LSAC to use those questions. And so typically the lower end options won't want to pay that. And so they kind of kind of mask what they're really doing. They're using fake ones. And you also want to make sure that you're using re- recent LSAT exams. Some of these books will use super old exams from like the early 90s and the exam has evolved over time. And so you're better off spending your time with the exams published in the last five, 10 years at least. So you offer tutoring, correct? Yeah, and so I do one-on-one work with students. That's part of what I do, yeah. Okay. Um, would you say that um, the tutoring uh, Working, well, I guess, obviously, with you, it's definitely helpful. Would you say that working in groups with other people that are studying for the LSAT as well is helpful, or do you think solo study would be better? That's a great question, and it's all good. And I actually want to, I appreciate what you were saying, but I actually want to challenge it a little bit, which is that working with, working, even if a tutor knows their stuff and they've been doing it for a long time, that doesn't necessarily mean it be a good fit. And so when you're considering to work with somebody one-on-one, you want to make sure that you've evaluated them fully. So you've spoken with them, you've gotten a sense of their experience, you've looked at their resources they've created to make sure that you like their style and their way of talking. Because if you don't, if you, if they know their stuff, but they're boring to talk to, or they're not engaging or not really looking at you as an individual, then you're going to, it's going to be a really long hour long session or two hour long session. So really make sure it's a good fit. But working with someone one-on-one can be helpful if they're able to really engage with you on your thought process process and help you find gaps in your understanding, looking at the way that you approach the problems personally. So my coaching is entirely personalized to the student I work with. My method is them and their problems, their issues, their thought processes. Study groups can also be enormously helpful. I highly recommend them. And that can help no matter where you're at. So let's say you're in the 140s and your study partners in the 160s. You can help each other. The 160s person still knows more than you do, and so they can give you advice. And on the other hand, if you're the person in the 160s, it really helps your understanding to explain it to someone else. So much of the benefit of discussing the LSAT problems, whether it's with myself or whether it's with another student, is forcing you to articulate your own thought process because you can't see your own blind spots. And it's too easy to look at answer keys or explanations and say, oh, I get it now. The real growth comes from articulating it in your own words. That's when you really kind of make it your own. And then if you're talking with someone else who understands it better than you do, then of course they can point out that there was an imprecise word that you used and you want to really show that you really didn't understand it as fully as you could have. And then going it alone is fine too. There's a lot to be said for writing things out. And so if you don't have a study buddy, you don't have a tutor and nobody wants to hear you talk about the LSAT, you can just write out by hand your own thought process or type out your own thought process, but really, again, put it in your own words. What downsides do you think there would be to studying in a group? Well, it could be a waste of time. If the group members are, are flaky, if they don't show up reliably, if they don't know anything or don't prep properly for the session. So let's say your study group is want, you want to review exam number 86 and mm-hmm. you show up, you did your homework, you did the exam, you come in and you have like a list of 10 problems you want to go over with your study buddies. And they didn't even bring test 86 with them or they didn't do it in advance. They show up late. They're wasting your time. You commuted from wherever else to come there. That could be a time sink. And so you want people who are reliable. And so 
If you find it, of course, it's great. In person is always better if you can do it, but it has the downsides of commuting. So if you find someone online, maybe a study buddy on a forum or something, then that can be beneficial because at least if they don't show up on time, you didn't have to go anywhere. Mm-hmm. But I'd say as long as, as long as they're physically there with you and discussing the problems, you can get something out of it. Right. So can the LSAT be learned exactly? Like going into it, culture, not knowing anything about it, what, how do you attack these beast of books <laughs> that they give us? Well, the LSAT can definitely be learned. I'm living proof of it. I went from the low 150s to a 175 on test day. And so that, and I've seen many other students do the same. I actually have many of their journeys chronicled in what I call LSAT diaries. They're on my website where students actually wrote in guest articles documenting their entire study journeys. And you see them going from low 140s to 160s and beyond. So it's definitely possible. And the question of how you do it, it's really about digging into the material, but also making it manageable. And so my study plans really break it down step by step. You learn the fundamentals, focusing on accuracy, untimed conditions, just giving yourself the chance to learn the basics. Then you bring in timing with individual sections of 35 minutes. And finally, last stage is endurance with full five section exams. So you want to build up gradually. It's kind of overwhelming to do a cold diagnostic and get a low score, but that's okay. That's natural. The LSAT is like a foreign language. So many words are used in unfamiliar ways that we don't typically use them in everyday speech. And so I think that if you can break it down into chunks, step by step, you'll achieve your goals in the end. If you just kind of lay it out bit by bit. And that's what I'm doing with the study plans is really breaking it down step by step. So breaking them down. So I know usually like when you take the test, obviously they have the sections like the logic games, the writing comprehension. Would you suggest attacking them section by section or kind of just taking in all the sections all at once? Does that make sense? Yeah, that's a totally. It's a great question. I, I break it down even further than section by section. I'll do, okay, logic games. There's a few types of logic games. There's ordering games, there's grouping games, and then there's combinations of those. And tell me if I'm getting too much in depth. I don't want to give you awful memories of back in the day. <laughs> but yes, yeah, so we break it down type by type, right? So game type by game type. So let's say we start off with ordering games. We do them the easiest ordering games to the medium difficulty to the most difficult. Then we move on to logical. Then we move on to grouping games and do the same thing. So I'll, in my study plans, I'll have like a week where we focus ex- mainly on logic games but not necessarily exclusively. So you can mix in a bit of logical reasoning or a bit of reading comp, even though the focus of the week is on logic games. And then while you're doing logical reasoning, that could be the focus, but you don't want to get rusty on the other sections. And it's good to mix it up a little bit now and then so that you don't get bored of it or overwhelmed or burned out. And so I'd say to mix up the things, it's a focus, but not exclusively. So I... I had heard back in the day that they don't really pay attention to the writing comprehension part. Is that true? Is it even worth, I guess, like spending a lot of time learning how to do it? Yeah, great question. So the writing sample, yeah, the writing sample is kind of weird because it's unscored. A lot of law schools don't even look at it. They don't even care about it. So the question is, why is it on there? And I think it's on there because the LSAT makers, well, they they know that lawyers have to be able to write well. And so that's, that's, but it's also would be a lot of work for them to score all these writing samples. Whereas, you know, the LSAT is like, it's on like a Scantron, right? It's going digital, but it's still multiple choice. So it's very quick. Like a computer can score that by writings, writing sample you actually have to look at. And so they don't really look at it. It's not worth spending time on. It's actually going digital as well. Starting in June, they're going to have you type it from your computer at home and they'll monitor you with a webcam and microphone to make sure that it's not somebody else doing it for you. So it's so weird. I'm imagining they have this whole database with like everyone on video just kind of typing away for 35 minutes. But because it'll be typed, maybe law schools will be slightly more likely to look at it because it's more legible. Think about writing it out by hand when nobody writes by hand anymore, at least when you're on the computer, right? So I think that law schools may be slightly more likely to look at it than they used to be, but they really only look at it in cases where they have a concern about the applicant's English fluency. So non-native speakers maybe can't write as well. And then of course, someone else could have helped them with a personal statement. So the law schools want to know what is your writing actually like? So the writing sample can be useful there because of course it's unfiltered and they know that you really did it. Then the other thing is maybe if they had concerns about, I don't know, that, that's pretty much it, honestly. I think that again, not worth focusing on it's worth taking a look at one maybe just to see how, what, it, what it's like, but ultimately I can, laid out in two seconds. Like basically you have a dilemma or a choice to make between two different options. Both options are equally weighted. You want to argue in favor of one over the other. 
but still acknowledges acknowledge the weaknesses of your side in relation to the other. But they're equally weighted, so you can't really go wrong. Just pick a side and argue for it. So how reflective do you think that LSAT scores are as far as how well you're going to do in law school? Do you think that that really is a good um, marker as to how well you're going to perform in law school? I think, I think it is. I mean, it, it, obviously it's not destiny. If you got a low LSAT score, you could still do fine in law school, but there is a strong correlation that the data supports it. And I think it's because the skills the LSAT is testing relate pretty closely to what law school is like. I mean, the LSAT has a lot of reading. It has advanced vocabulary. It has boring topics, makes you kind of juggle all these different factors in your mind at once. And then, I mean, you could speak to this better than I can, but I think this all relates very closely to what you're actually doing in law school. And so, of course, the LSAT's hard. It's timed and requires a lot of preparation. But I think also law school is hard. You, you have exams and they require a lot of preparation as well. So I think that it does relate. And of course, you could say, well, I didn't have enough time to study for the LSAT. But if you don't have enough time to st study for the LSAT, how are you going to have the time for law school? So I think it's a question of making a priority and just committing to the process. What would you suggest for um, those test takers that might have bad test anxiety? Because that's something that I've seen a lot in law school, and apparently they were a lot worse when they took the LSAT. So what, what is your suggestions for those? Well, anxiety is, anxiety is definitely a big thing. Aside from just the exam content, there's performing under pressure on test day. So a couple of things I think about. One of them is training yourself to focus, and this is related to mindfulness, of course. I really recommend mindfulness meditation. And the idea is basically being able to focus on the task at hand and not be distracted by what came before or by what's coming next. So let's say you're on question number 18, but question 17 gave you a lot of trouble. You want to have the confidence and the focus on question 17 to let go of it and move on to 18. And you train yourself to do that by mindfulness in a way, by focusing on the task at hand. If your mind wanders, you notice it wandering and you bring it back. And so if you've ever tried to focus on your breath during meditation or anything like that, it's, it's hard. Your mind does wander and that's okay. The idea is that you, every time you notice it wandering and you bring it back, that's progress, that's growth, that's strengthening your, abil your mental ability to focus. And you might feel bad at, at failing as, as your mind wanders, but that's okay. The, the benefit of wandering is that you notice it wander and you bring it back. And so if you can do that while training at home, even just five minutes a day, you can then learn to do that on test day as well. The other thing I could talk about is simulating test day conditions. A lot of times students take practice tests in the comfort of their own home, doing only four sections, not five, maybe not strictly timing, them, timing themselves. And then on test day, when the exam itself is so much harder than that because it is strictly timed, there are five sections, the endurance is real, it's harder. And then of course you can fall short. And so practicing like it's game day makes a big difference too. But if you've done five, 10, 15 timed exams, under realistic conditions, then you can maximize your odds of making your exam the real one, just another practice test. Mm -hmm. So what would you recommend uh, if someone is right in the middle of the test and maybe they spent a little bit too long on the last question and they're running out of time, would you suggest just going through and filling in blanks or? What, yeah, I mean, there's, there's... There are a lot that, that had that issue where they would run out of time. Oh, of course. I mean, you should definitely fill in the blanks because there's no guessing penalty. So maybe at the five minute mark, if timing's an issue for you and you're consistently not finishing with time, then at the five minute mark, you'd want to bubble in D perhaps for every single answer choice, just to at least, so at least you have something written down. And then of course you can go through as many of those problems as you can in order to tackle them and actually give them a shot. But then also that tells us that of course, timing and pacing is a big thing to work on during your practice. Or maybe if you just know that you're never going to finish a section timed, then you could maybe attempt only three passages or only three logic games and not even try to do all, all the questions. Because maybe doing three and focusing on those will give you higher accuracy than doing the entire thing but rushing through it. Mm -hmm. Would you recommend on um, the questions, reading the question first and then the answers and then going to like back to a fact pattern? Or would you suggest reading the facts first and then moving on to the question? That's a great question. So for logical reasoning, this comes up a lot. Should I read the stimulus or the question stem first? And I'd recommend question stem first because it gives you a different perspective from which to view the stimulus. That's mm -hmm. my opinion. It's, what it's what's worked for me. But there are plenty of high scorers, you know, smart people on both sides of this who argue each side. There are plenty of people who say, read the stimulus first, read the argument first, then read the question stem. So I'd say ultimately, try out both and see what works best for you. I'm not particularly dogmatic on this issue. Mm -hmm. And especially with the 
uh, the comprehension questions. I've heard of annotating next to the paragraphs. Is that a thing? Like, is that actually helpful to do? Yeah, definitely. So I, you know, this is for reading comprehension, people always ask about how should I take notes? What should I do? And I find that typically students write too much on the passage. They'll underline, they'll highlight, they'll circle, they'll mark everything up, and then you can't even look at it properly later. And you can't unsee your markings. So I do recommend actually instead marking in the margins next to the lines in which these ideas appear. So you want to look for the viewpoints of the author and the viewpoints expressed by different people in the passage. You want to look for the evidence that's supporting those viewpoints. And then you want to look to mark who, if anyone, is advocating those viewpoints. And so I would mark simply VEA in the margins next to the lines in which those things appear. This is going to change, though, with the digital LSAT coming later this year, starting in July and then September, where you can't write on the tablet at all. It's crazy, but there's no way to actually draw freehand on the tablet the way you might expect to be able to do on a piece of paper. And so that's going to mean that no more, no more marking in that way. You'll have to make any notes on scrap paper instead. Let's say someone takes the exam and they don't perform as well. Are there quick ways to boost your score as far as getting it higher the next time? Yeah, Probably definitely. A high margin, I guess, of difference between your first, second, third, whatever. Yeah, of course. For, for retaking, you can improve significantly. Significantly, a lot of it depends on what you did previously. So maybe if you didn't study that much or other things got in the way, you can then, like we talked about schedules earlier, you can then carve out the time in your schedule over the course of a week or over the course of a month to put in the time. You might also want to think about getting better resources or more resources. A lot of people don't want to spend the money on an LSAT prep book that's 20 bucks, but that 20 buck book could lead to a couple more points on the LSAT, which could mean thousands in scholarship money. And so you want to think about, have I given myself all the resources that would set me up for success? So maybe that requires getting another book of exams. Maybe it requires getting a tutor. Maybe it requires doing a study group. So whatever you've been thinking of doing, but didn't actually take action on, doing that next time around can make an enormous difference for, for your for your potential, for your score in the end. Mm -hmm. So what would your advice be? Because I can imagine that getting a low LSAT score is kind of a hit to the ego a little bit, especially if you spent a long time preparing for it. What would your advice be to someone that, you know, might feel a little defeated after they get their score back? Yeah, of course. I mean, that's, that's really common. It's super discouraging. And that's part of why I'm not a huge fan of taking diagnostics cold. But even if you did study and didn't do as well as you wanted, that's normal. It happens retaking is more common than ever. You are not your LSAT score and plenty of smart people start off with, with low scores. You know, I started off in the low 150s and it was only very gradually over the course of an entire year that I brought my score to 175. And so mm -hmm. if you haven't spent an entire year, I'm not saying that you need to, but it does take more than a couple of months to reach your fullest potential. And it does take dozens and hundreds of hours. And so people will say, I did 10 exams. I did a lot. But 10 exams is only 40 logic games and only 40 reading comprehension passages. It's actually not that much in the grand scheme of things. You really need to do a couple dozen exams to have seen everything under the sun. So I would encourage folks who got low scores to think about what else they could do differently next time around. I know that you are not your LSAT score. And even if you can't raise it in the end, that's okay. Maybe you'll get in based on your GPA. Maybe you can get in based on the soft factors in your application. And also we talked about the LSAT being an indication of how you might do in law school. But even that is not necessarily an indication of how you'll do as an attorney. There are so many other things involved in being a successful attorney aside from how you do on an exam. There's people skills, there's networking, there's business savvy. There are people who got low LSAT scores and went to unranked law schools who have very successful careers based on the networks they've been able to build. And so I would say, while the LSAT does relate to law school quite a bit, it won't necessarily determine your entire career. So if someone maybe doesn't perform as well as they would hope on the LSAT, as far as the admissions process go, what would you suggest that they could do to kind of, I guess, um, cushion that blow a little bit? Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, the biggest thing would still be to retake because even just a few more points can make a big difference. But if you decided that retaking is not for you, you're done with the LSAT forever, you can think about other things. Of course, your GPA, under, if you're still an undergrad, you want to make sure your GPA is as high as possible. You also want to ma maintain connections with professors who might write letters of, re letters of recommendation for you. And so keeping in touch with them, even just maybe on social or pinging them every three to six months just to check in to stay on their radar, that can help you to get the most compelling letter of rec possible. 
There's also, of course, the personal statement. There's also addenda, diversity statements, optional essays. And so making all of those as polished and professional as possible, having other people read them over, people don't do that enough. But I've talked to people who had 40 friends and family and people in their networks read their personal statements. And if each person gives you one comment, that can transform your personal statement altogether. I even talked with one, with one person who was reaching out to people on LinkedIn who were alums and just cold emailing them saying, hey, can you look at this for me? And believe it or not, they did. And that can be a huge help. And then, of course, you can also go the route of hiring an editor or an admission consultant to help you as well. Mm-hmm. Okay, awesome. What other, sir? So, after our discussion, I've noticed that you do a, you offer a lot of services. Can you touch on those a little bit as far as like what uh, you said you do tutoring, you help prepare schedules? What, what else do you offer? Yeah, sure. So I've been doing this for over 10 years now. I, my, my main website is the LSAT blog, which I've done for that period of time. And I've got over a thousand articles on there on every aspect of LSAT prep and law school admissions. I try to really be comprehensive with it and I built it over a long time. So that's one starting point. I have on there all the free articles with study plans, cheat sheets, guides, explanations as well. I have the LSAT diaries, which feature student stories. And I also have now a YouTube channel called LSAT Unplugged with discussions like what we're doing now, with also with admission officers, with legal career experts, other LSAT instructors. And so that's a great resource. And I also have the LSAT Unplugged podcast. Aside from all that, I also have video courses covering every section of the exam, as well as the personal statement and test day mindsets. You asked about anxiety earlier. I have an entire course focused just on prepping for test day itself, simulating test day conditions and overcoming the anxiety. Let's see what else. Yeah, then I do the one-on-one, one-on-one in coaching. I also am organizing small group coaching and study groups as well. So folks who are interested in any of that, of course, can reach out and I'll share the links with you as well. Well, that's awesome. Are you planning on going, stepping into the bar anytime soon? Well, it's kind of funny. I, I am interested in that, but I haven't gone to law school myself, so I would need to partner with someone else, but that would definitely be a fun project. Definitely. Well, I am so appreciative for you giving me your time today and chatting about the LSAT. I know that I still learned a few things. <laughs> and it's, So thank you so much for, for your time today. Of course, Mia. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for connecting. Looking forward to chatting with you again soon.